uh, truly a pleasure, and I want to thank uh, the university uh, for the opportunity to speak about U.S.-European relations and particularly about the upcoming Lithuanian presidency of the European Council. It is really a pleasure to start off as speaking engagement, as I noted, two months here, um, here at Vilnius University. And I would like to thank the director, um, Ramunas Vilipsauskas, as well as Ugne Barastiute for uh, including me in this series that are being uh, organized. And um, I also point out, as my colleagues wanted me to note, that this is going to be uh, live streamed on Facebook, and we're open to all questions. But I wanted to start out today with sort of a broad, uh, broad discussion and then move it to some specifics. Uh, I will also add at certain points comments here and there, and if you'll permit me, I'll also draw on my own experience and give you some vignettes here and there of uh, how some of these issues come alive. Um, I'd like to start more broadly on the following, which is, and I would like to thank my staff for uh, finding this, one of our first presidents, the first president, President George Washington, said, said in a very prescient way, someday following the example of the United States of America, there will be a United States of Europe. Now, some may take that comment one way, some may take it another, but I will show you why I think it's important that we speak of united uh, groupings as we face our common challenges. More recently, President Obama said in America, and this is, I think, very important to note, there's a failure to appreciate Europe's leading role in the world. What is certain is that Europe and the United States are partners in helping to shape the tide of history and ensuring peace, security, as well as economic prosperity across the globe. The challenge for both of us going forward in the 21st century is to take our common bonds and shared values and work together in engaging the new powerhouses of the world, such as China, India, and Brazil, to build a true global set, and I will repeat this, of standards and principles. It's always been clear that countries whose economies are closely linked are more likely to be able to forge and shape a common future in other areas. When our new Secretary of State gave his first speech, I will note he gave it to students in my old university. I was quite proud of that. And he stated, and this is applicable, I think, to students globally today. He said, speaking to US students, American students, in today's global world, there is no longer anything foreign about foreign policy. The lives of Americans are more intertwined than ever before with the lives of people in parts of the world that we may never, never have visited. In the global challenges of diplomacy, development, economic security, and environmental security, you will feel our success or failure just as strongly as those people in those other countries that you'll never meet. As you know, U.S. ties with Europe evolved significantly in the last century. After the Second World War, leaders recognized that our common future depended on Europe's economic recovery hence the Marshall Plan. The divisions that still existed in Europe also required other structures, the centerpiece of which is NATO, and Americans and Western Europeans recognized that our bilateral relationship was one of military necessity uh, required for all of Europe's security. But in 2013, we face an entirely different world. While the importance of our relationship with Europe has not changed, there is a generation, or maybe two, on both sides of the Atlantic for whom the Cold War and structures and alliances created during it have little relevance. Many Americans and Europeans, students like yourself, have known only a unified Germany and a united Europe. Though that Cold War is thankfully over, our work in continuing to build U.S.-European relations is not. Even as we continue to recognize the need for strong security cooperation, our goal is now firmly focused on further enhancing mutual prosperity. Today we have the opportunity to draw on the same common values and same shared interests to build a transatlantic relationship that meets the needs of a new century, 
as well as serving as a beacon for the rest of the globe. Today, the compelling argument, and this is a key point, the compelling argument for strong transatlantic ties must be future-oriented, based on jobs and economic growth, and of course on shared values, not on containing some common enemy. Let me turn a little bit now uh, to the upcoming EU Council Presidency for Lithuania and the negotiations for the agreement that we spoke of earlier, which is the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. This is an historically important project that both uh, the US and Europe will soon undertake. As I mentioned in an interview recently, it is highly likely that once the consultation period with our parliament, our Congress, ends, we will be ready to begin negotiations and the timing appears to coincide, at least for the launch of INDEP, with Lithuania's EU presidency, though I must salute the Irish, who will maybe will be, have, be there at the formal beginning, but it's going to take the common effort as we go forth. And they have done tremendous, tremendous work on this. So why is this important in general for Americans, for Europeans, and for Lithuanians? First of all, we all recognize by now that our economies are deeply intertwined and we need to continue to get out of this economic crisis together. Over the past few years, our economies have really struggled and our citizens have truly suffered. Although the U.S. is starting to recover its economic growth, European growth is still lagging. But it is absolutely clear, US, the U.S. cannot fully recover until Europe does. Lithuania will take over the presidency of the Council of the EU at a very challenging time. Austerity has made us focus on how we manage our resources and partner around the world. The U.S. realized some time ago that we had to leverage this transatlantic economic relationship to create more jobs and economic growth. And after many years of painstaking work, the U.S. and the EU reached the decision that the time to do something ambitious and pragmatic is now. It is true that the so-called pivot of U.S. foreign and economic policy to Asia has received much attention of late. In a recent speech in Munich, our engagement with Asia does not come at Europe's expense. In fact, the Vice President noted that it is profoundly in Europe's interest for the United States to engage more broadly with the world, and we should be doing many more of these things fully and actively together. There's no denying the economic importance of Asia. It has an enormous economic priority for the United States, as it does for Europe. Indeed, I believe that both Europe and the United States will be in a stronger position to meet the competitive challenges of Asia if we have strong economic ties with one another and we agree on high standards. Though not in my speech, I will give you an example. We have negotiated with the EU common investment principles as we believe firmly that investment needs to be guided by certain rules of transparency, openness, fairness, etc. There are those who do not believe in those rules. And as we face cash-rich Asian economies that are investing in the United States, that are investing in Europe, there are no set standards which they need to adhere to. So we came out with a set of investment principles which we are using in all major international four that clearly outline that if you want to invest in Europe, if you want to invest in the United States, you need to adhere to rules and regulations. Simply put, strength and economic ties between the United States and the European Union and the benefits they produce for both of our economies will enhance our ability to build stronger relationships with the new economic powerhouses in the world. This will not come automatically. The United States, Lithuania, and the other members of the EU need to build on our shared economic interests and values in order to collectively demonstrate our support for them. That's why I made reference to the investment principles. This will give us together a stronger platform to seek support for global acceptance of rules, norms, and practices that have been so important in the success of the global economy we have today. One that has benefited both sides of the Atlantic and a number of emerging economies as well. 
And this cooperation can also create jobs, an essential element on both sides of the Atlantic. They're currently, and uh, these figures have been uh, used on several occasions, approximately 13 to 14 million jobs in the US and the EU supported by our, our current trade and investment relationship. And let me pause here and note, there have been significant investments by European companies in the United States. We, for the first time since World War II, are actively seeking investment from overseas. It always came naturally, but it dropped in the financial crisis. So we have been encouraging this kind of investment in, uh, in the United States, and also because it follows rules and norms. Our arms are open for that kind of investment, just as when our companies come over here, because we follow rules and norms. The current estimates is that going forward with this new agreement, uh, it can deliver an extra 1 to 2% of GDP growth on both sides. That is a huge increase from current figures today. It will undoubtedly take a lot of hard work over the next months and years. It's, we're not quite sure how long this will take. And it's sometimes easy to think that because the benefits appear obvious, everyone sees it that way. But to get this agreement implemented, um, it will only happen if every stakeholder truly believes they have a benefit in this. And therefore, I want to stress, it's the responsibility of policymakers to reach out to business communities, NGOs, civil society, academia, consumer associations, and the media to ensure that they are all included, will be listened to, and, partic and in particular to articulate why this trade and investment partnership makes sense for companies as well as consumers alike. In short, a good high standard comprehensive agreement is probably the best way and perhaps the only way to ensure that we remain global economic leaders. And in this dialogue between the United States and the European Union with the Lithuanian presidency and the, the very uh, uh, big agenda that will be included in it, I want to just mention a couple of uh, comments on the issue of data privacy because I think there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding. Um, you have, may have heard a number of things on this, but I want to be very clear that the bottom line is that the United States and the European Union share the same goals, which is absolutely to protect privacy and facilitate trade and economic growth. What we want to do is work closely with the European Union and other nations to achieve global interoperability of data protection. Creating poorly regulated regulatory environments for data exchange will slow down transatlantic and global trade instead of generating the jobs and growth that we need today. I want to turn now to talk a little bit about uh, where uh, certain issues that the U.S. is emphasizing today in its foreign policy. Our president has asserted that we need a strong foreign policy to protect our interests in the world. And he and the Secretary have maintained that a wise investment in foreign policy can yield smart benefits not only for ourselves, but friends and partners around the world. Our goal in Europe, as it has been in other places, is to work with others as partners, friends, and allies to create open markets, economic opportunities, ensure peace and security, and most importantly as well, to establish the rule of law. Today, for example, we work uh, day in and day out across all of Europe uh, with partners, and in particularly Lithuania, on joint priorities and interests around the globe. And I think it's important for students to recognize that the transatlantic relationship is about working global issues and issues beyond the borders of Europe and the United States. Whether that's ensuring a non-nuclear Iran, containing the nuclear threat in North Korea, working towards a peaceful solution to the ongoing conflict between Israel and Palestine, and ensuring that the terrible humanitarian tragedy in Syria comes to an end soon. We also work on common economic challenges, energy security, global energy security, the protection of intellectual property without whom we lose a lot of the benefits of our uh, most innovative Freedom of the internet, there is a commercial, there is a philosophical, there's a political aspect to defending the freedom of the internet. Climate change, which is extremely important. 
and poverty reduction around the world, to name a few. And I want to signal um, another key U.S. foreign policy priority where we've worked closely with Europe, and that is gender equality. Countries are more peaceful and prosperous when women participate fully in the economy. We have worked across the globe to give women full access from getting an education to starting and running businesses to sitting on corporate boards to having access to communication as well as finance, which some say their own money. I had the pleasure with Secretary Clinton in participating in a number of fora uh, talking about women in the economy. And in particular, there was one uh, event in San Francisco. And when you saw the delegations that came from, in this case, the APEC countries, from around uh, those, that vast part of the world, it was a formidable cadre of women that came. They came in waves coming through the door and uh, huge delegations, excuse me, of women who were ministers of finance, ministers of the economy, owners of major businesses, inventors, technocrats. Uh, it was absolutely amazing. And the aim of the conference and the aim of what we're trying to achieve is such that we have no separate conferences. They should be fully integrated. An example of how we've worked closely with Lithuania is in Afghanistan on this issue. In 2002, there were fewer than a million, um, I'm sorry, there were fewer than a million boys in Afghan schools and barely any girls. So obviously the level of education was low. Now, thanks to the work of Americans, Europeans, and Lithuanians, more than a third of the almost eight million students going to school are girls and more than a quarter of their representatives in parliament, this is where the power comes, are women. Simply as human beings, both sides of the Atlantic should be extremely proud of that achievement. And it is not limited to Afghanistan. Education is also a key foreign policy priority of the United States, which is one reason why I'm here at Billionist University. We promote programs that some of you are familiar with, like the Fulbright, the Humphrey, the uh, International Visitor Leadership, and our Lithuanian high school exchange program because they enable the most talented people to share their ideas, hopes, friendships, and establish bonds to work together for common good. These exchanges bring hundreds of thousands of people every year to the United States from other countries and vice versa. And eventually it is this network which will thread the patterns of new global relationships. As an aside, 19% of the foreign students in the United States are from China. As a result, when you go to meetings with Chinese officials, they have fewer people with microphones than we do. So now we have an initiative to try to send thousands of Americans to China, just to illustrate one example. But these academic exchanges, these global ones, are keys, keys, keys to developing new patterns in the future. That, that is my point. Young people are linked together as never before in history, including you here in this room. You are much more global than your predecessors and you have access to incredible technology. You also face much more competition for jobs, global competition for jobs. The networking that is developed in the programs that I mentioned is an extremely useful tool for that economic future. So in conclusion, I would like to note that the partnership between the U.S. and Europe is obviously very deep and growing. It's helping advance a number of agenda items around the world. If Americans and Europeans can continue to support that investment energetically, I personally don't think we'll find, as we say in English, a better deal anyplace else. In this century, we need to ensure that current and future generations of Americans and Europeans recognize not just the legacies we share, but that the futures are intertwined. It's important that we re reinforce the values and principles that underpin our society and our systems of government. On both sides of the Atlantic, many take this relationship for granted or don't think enough about that. We can change this. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions.